It's Defend Life. We're doing our 22nd annual Maryland Face the Truth Tour. We just completed our 14th stop. It was wonderful. There was probably 40 of us out on this giant median strip showing the ugly reality of abortion. Here we are at St. Joseph's Fullerton Catholic Church, a very friendly parish, and we want to thank Father Jesse Boulder for his wonderful hospitality. And we have a great main speaker. His name is Barry Sullivan. But before Barry Sullivan, we have an even more important speaker. His name is Emiliano. Emiliano, who are your parents? Joan and Christopher Bell. Has anybody heard of Joan and Christopher Bell? Yes. Two of the great heroes of the pro-life movement. Chris is the head of Good Council Homes that runs four homes, three of them in New York, for pregnant mothers, not only helping them deliver their babies, but enabling them to have their babies there for at least a year and giving them some job skills, teaching them some job skills. They also have a place in New Jersey. Fantastic. Uh, who was the co-founder? Father Benedict Rochelle. Everybody has heard of Father yeah. Benedict Rochelle. And everybody knows who Joan Andrews Bell is. She doesn't need any introduction. She's one of the great heroes and one of the great rescuers. Anyway, this is one of their sons. And his name is Emiliano. His last name is Bell. Please welcome Emiliano Bell. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. disciples of Jesus Christ. Am I in the right room? Let's try that again. Good afternoon, disciples of Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. Thank you. Well, my story begins, as some of you know, in Mexico. I was born in Mexico, and I was found in a garbage can as a newborn by the Mexican authorities. And the officer who found me gave me the name Emiliano Soto del Rosario. Now, for some of my Hispanic friends that are in the room, and I'll give you three chances, but I need you to say them out loud. What does my middle name translate in English? That's the last part, but what does Soto del translates to? Of the rosary. Anybody else? Valley of the rosary. And then when I was, after I was found, I was put in an orphanage till I was five. And then I was adopted by Christopher and Joan Bell. And I was brought to this country. And I was thrown into, or should I say, thrown to, into the front lines of the pro-life movement as soon as I came to the country. And maybe between nine and 10, I did my first rescue and I saved an un, a child from an abortion. The story, goes, the story goes that the father brought his wife into the abortion mill because the doctors that showed the sonogram told the couple that the child was missing a leg, a limb, I should say, and, they, and the child would not be happy in this world. And, and so I was going back and forth, just counseling, because there's a lot of people there, and the abortionist would come out now and then for smoke. He threatened me and my mother, saying, I'll have him arrested and haul away if he don't stop talking to me. But I kept talking to him. And, but that's just on a side note. What I said to the father was that after he told me what the prognosis was, I said, look at me, I'm happy. In fact... I know of a little girl that came from Mexico that was adopted around the same time I was who had no arms and legs and she's happier than I am. And in fact, she worked for my father for a while and she's living on her own right now in Hoboken, New Jersey. So I wanna thank you and I wanna express my great gratitude to Jack and all of the core team members and this is my first time with all of you, and I hope to be back. Thank you.
Barry Sullivan really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll tell you a little bit anyway. Uh, his mother, Kathleen Sullivan, how old is she now, 85? 88. 88, and she's amazing. And one of the reasons he is the great pro-life Catholic man, family man he is because of his wonderful mother. Uh, everybody knows who Phil, oh, your dad has something to do with it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was hard for his father to be second fiddle to his wife. You know, it's like Mr. Stephanie Gray or somebody like that. Well, <laughs> anyway, but he was a great father. And uh, anyway, you might be interested to know, she basically has done a great job uh, promoting the abstinence message. Yeah. Call it chastity, call it abstinence. Well, we all know what we're talking about here. If you call it abstinence, it's easier to get into public schools. And she was the best friend of probably the greatest living American at the time, whose name was, I'll tell you her first name, Phyllis, what was her last name? Yeah. And she spent, Kathleen, Barry's mother, spent the last five months of Phyllis Schlafly's life with her in St. Louis. Truly a great, great American who did so much, beat the Equal Rights Amendment not once, but twice. She did it all, wrote great books, went to law school, homeschooled her kids, did it all. Anyway, Barry's uh, mom's closest friend was Phyllis. Now, he's been doing great work. He, he's a nuclear engineer, went to Northwestern, was in the Navy, has run for Congress, very politically astute. He's the adoptive father of two wonderful children, one of whom just got married recently. That's a story to itself. Uh, the, without further introduction, please welcome Barry Sullivan. Following Emilio, is, that's the first time I'm going to have to follow somebody who probably has more to say than I do. So that was, he's one of my heroes when I saw him here. And Peter Shin, who is also here, Peter's missing part of his leg. And that I weave that into my talk. Now, the name of this talk is Sowing Seeds in the Field of Life and Harvesting a Lifetime of Joy. So I'm going to share very personal stories with you about my life, the blessings God has given me, the mir miracles that took part in my life. But I don't want you to leave here thinking he's a saint, he's a great guy, because all glory goes to God and the blessings that he gave me with my two parents, okay? So I want to convey this stuff to you, the joy that I've known since I was this high due to their involvement. Okay, so I want to ask somebody who hasn't been here before, what are your two main goals in life? They're very simple. Father Wilde covered it in his talks. How to, well, that's, you will do that in meeting these goals. What's the number one goal you have? Anybody? Save your mortal soul. Save your soul. And the second one is tied to the first one. Take as many people with you as possible. Everything you do is connected to those two goals. Until you adapt those as your two goals, you will never have peace. You will always find something that's not right in life, that depresses you, etc., etc. Once you adopt those, you will always have peace. You'll have ups and downs, but you will never leave the peace that Christ is talking about. Now our Lord said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So if the goal the most important thing to you is saving your soul, you are morally obligated to try and save your neighbor's soul. It's not a nice thing to do. If you don't try to do that, I contend you will not save your soul. So that's how you should look at it. When Jesus was asked, are you a king? The Lord said, the reason I came into the world is to testify to the truth. And that's what we're called to do. The Lord also said, if you deny me before men on earth, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. 
If we are silent on the issues, we are denying the Lord. And if anybody ever tells you we're all going to heaven, that's a lie. It's not biblical. Okay? I always I, I teach uh, high school kids, and I always ask them, what percentage of people are going to heaven? And they start guessing 70%, 40%. And then somebody says, I don't think the Lord stated that. I was like, that's correct. In fact, the only place in the Bible where he talks about numbers, he says the road to perdition is wide and many choose it. The road to everlasting life is narrow. So if you want to think about it, the majority might end up in hell. Okay, and I also told them if the Lord said, okay, 60% are saved, you're going to be in a group of 10 people, and you're going to be looking for four people who are worse than you. This way, if you're not judged against other people, hopefully you're setting your own standards. Jesus never cared what the majority thought. If you read the Gospels, he was always preaching, and they were always plotting to kill him, okay? He was raising people from the dead, walking on water, feeding thousands of people. We do none of that. And he also told us, blessed are you when they persecute you because of me as they persecuted me before you. So in this day and age, if you're not getting persecuted, if you're not upsetting people, you are not testifying to the truth. Okay? Hosea 4. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay? We've been doing this for 22 years. I would bet you you can find 10 people at your church and ask them, how late in a woman's pregnancy can you get an abortion? And I'll bet you over half of them and I mean people who have gone to the March for Life for years will not know that abortion is legal to the moment of birth and has been in Maryland since 1973, okay? You shouldn't have any family or friends that don't know that fact. And you can say to them, hey, did you know that abortion is legal to the moment of birth? If a family or friend gets upset at that, and doesn't like you, find new friends. Amen. That person yeah. is not your friend. Okay? I read a book by Philip Neary. He said, A joyous heart is more easily made perfect than a one that is cast down. People are constantly looking for joy. Okay? You see people on the street. You see people going by us. Some of them are very bitter. People walk down the street. They're not smiling. We should always be smiling. We should greet people. People should want to know what makes you tick. Okay? Because they want part of that. If you're the kind of person that's moody, people don't want that. They want to know what makes you tick, but they don't want any of it. And it's when things are down that people are really want to know what's your faith like. Recent polls stated that 85% of those confirmed Catholics in the eighth grade will leave the church, all churches, by the time they're 21. Roughly 30% of Catholics attend Mass weekly, and this is the one that really got me. Over 100,000 people committed suicide, mostly by drug overdoses, last year. Okay, 100,000 people. In my 22 year, or actually 45 years in the pro-life movement, I've never had anybody who's been active say my kid committed suicide. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but people who go to something like this and have what we had happen 15 years ago, we had to face the true signs, 7.30 in the morning on a Tuesday, and a couple drove past us, pulled into the parking lot, and the first thing I thought was, someone's going to start yelling at me, and I haven't even had any coffee. <laughs> Which is a very selfish thing to think. But they sat there for a minute, they got out of their car, came over, and they said, we just want you to know that we live together, we're on our way to work, she's pregnant, we had an abortion schedule for Saturday, and because of your signs, 
we're not going to do it. Okay? Now, I, I bring that up because there were high school and college kids there, and they know that they've now saved a life and maybe two souls. So I contend in the depressions in their life or the rejections, whatever, they will always think back to that and they will know I have a purpose in life. I don't need drugs. I don't need sex outside of marriage. I have served a purpose and I know what that purpose is. There's 40 to 50 million abortions worldwide each year. There's still over a million in the USA. There's a book, Tears of the Fishermen. It's about this thick. I highly recommend. You can read it in probably two hours. A gentleman did a study of violent criminal inmates in Florida. 90% of them had something to do with an abortion before they got arrested for the crime. 90%, and it didn't matter what race you were, okay? Because after they took part or they couldn't stop their girl from getting an abortion, their lives crumbled, okay? So if we're really interested in stopping you know, keeping people out of prison, that's what we have to go at. Our responsibility is to testify to the truth to those in our circle of influence. I like to think of life as a big orchestra pit and it's got ev or an orchestra with everybody that's ever lived and those who are still alive. And the way I figure it, the Blessed Mother, uh, Jesus is the conductor, the Blessed Mother and the saints are in the first hundreds of thousands of rows, and I'm about five billion rows back, okay? But the people around me can hear how I play my music more than they can hear what St. Benedict said 1,500 years ago. And God knows who isn't playing their music. And you can't play my music, I can't play your music, okay? You have to influence. You may not be able to stop abortion in the United States. You may not be able to stop it in the world. But there's people around you that you can influence. And if you save one soul, that's more important than curing cancer. And you have to believe that because we're talking an eternity. You can't think of eternity. Have you ever tried to think of how long eternity is. It's impossible to think about. Okay, let me give you a few scenarios that uh, I constantly think about. And I usually ask questions, but to make it shorter, there's a fire in your house at, thank at Christmas, okay? At 2.30 in the morning, all your relatives are in. You wake up, you start screaming, you get everybody out. You're not worried about, oh, gee, my cousin doesn't like me. If I wake him up at 2 in the morning, he's really going to be ticked off. You want to save his, soul, his life, right? You want to save his life, right? Now, the way, reason you were able to do that is you needed four things. You needed recognize the threat. You needed to know how to save the people from the threat. You had to care about the people, and you had to have the courage to act, okay? Without those four things, you can't save the people. So you go to a hotel late at night, three in the morning, your family goes up, you go to sleep, all of a sudden the alarms go off. You open the door and it's filled with smoke. You tell your family, go this way. Unfortunately, the exit's that way, you all die. What you didn't have is that first thing, knowledge, or the second thing, knowledge of how to mitigate the threat, okay? So now you go to the barbecue in the summer. So one of your nieces or nephews says, you know, I'm not eating at school. Of course, you're going to try to convince them to eat. You don't want them to die, right? Nobody's going to get upset at you if you do that. Then he comes back, another one says, I'm selling and using drugs. Hopefully you'll step in and say, hey, that's not a right thing to do. Here's a million reasons why. You're not going to think, well, John's not going to like me if I try to save his life, right? It's more important. Now, 
kid comes back and you say, hey, how's the church on campus? Well, you know, I'm not going to mass anymore. I'm not going to church. I don't really need that. Most people won't say anything because they're worried that somebody's going to get angry. Now, as Christians, if we really believe that saving our soul is more important than saving our life, you must say something, okay? That's where people are going to get angry at you because you're taking a stand and you're telling them something they're doing morally is wrong. And you've got, you would want somebody to do that to you to save your soul so you are morally required. So what, what about mass? The rich young man asked the Lord, what must I do to inherit everlasting life, right? What did he tell him? What did the Lord tell him real quick? Right. Most people say, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's not the first thing he says. It's amazing. Most people say that. He said, keep the commandments. Third commandment, keep holy the Sabbath. For Catholics, that's we go to mass. Okay? So right there, if somebody says, I'm not going to mass, their mortal soul or immortal soul is in danger. Okay? The second thing. The Lord said, unless you eat the body of the Son of Man, you cannot have life within you. And many of them left him on that teaching and would go with him no more. That's the only place in the Bible that it says, and many of them left him and they would go with him no more. And the final thing, if, you, if the Lord somehow came to you and said, you're going to die tonight, okay, and you were married, it would seem that you're going to probably try and give your family the most important things that you want them to remember, right? Do this, do that. Make sure, you know, John's raised this way, et cetera, et cetera. What did our Lord do when he knew he was going to die? One of the last things was give us the Eucharist. One of the last things before the, before the passion started. Right. No, but I'm talking about before the passion. Okay. He said, do this in memory of me. He didn't say, you know what? It'd really be nice if you guys could kind of do that. It was an order from God himself. I remember hearing the story of St. Tarsistus. He was in Rome when they were persecuting Christians. And he was 14 years old. And they used to have the deacons would take the Eucharist throughout the city. You know, they'd celebrate it in the catacombs, and then they would take it out. Well, it turns out the deacon that was supposed to do this one trek was sick, didn't show up. So St. Tarsus offered to do it. And it's like, no, no, we can't let you do it. You're too young. And he insisted. And I read this story when I was 10 years old. And he was carrying him in his cloak, and he was going through Rome. A group of boys figured out what he was doing, and they said, what are you hiding? And they ripped open his cloak. And the Eucharist fell on the floor, on the ground. And as he bent over to pick him up, they beat him to death. Okay? When I heard that story as a 10-year-old, I've never questioned whether or not I'm going to Mass. People have given their lives for that. And yet some people say, ah, oh, it's not really that important. Someone says they see nothing wrong with gay marriage and the LGBT agenda. We now have the male swimmer in the female locker room smashed all the records. And people, Christians will tell you Jesus is okay with that. And you have to ask yourself, if one of your cousins or sons or daughters was getting married in a gay marriage, would you go? No. Never. Right. Never. I've had many people say, well, I, did. I said, Jesus said, unless you love me more than mother and son, Etc., etc., you are not worthy of me. And he also said, I did not come for peace, but a sword, where it will pit mother against daughter, and it goes through every relationship. Okay? You're going to have problems, and I can tell you, I've got 34 nieces and nephews, including, or 32, and my two kids, and there's, everything's not perfect. In our family, okay? On my wife's side, same thing, okay? And I haven't gone to people's weddings, and it has caused problems, okay? 
But you have to ask yourself, okay, the Lord said, that's why they were created, male and female. And the man should leave his mother and father and a woman her home and the two become one. If you embrace the LGBT agenda, you're saying God is a liar. Amen. Okay? That's what you're saying. And if you really care about somebody's soul more than you having trouble with the family relationships, you take a stand. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. We have to do that. It's getting so bad now. If I had told you five years ago they'd have drag queens for three and four year olds, you would have said Barry is a nut job. Okay? But you got to remember there is no bottom of the barrel for evil. These people are evil. Bishop Sheen put it very well. He said there's two types of sinners there's bad sinners, they do things to aggrandize themselves. For instance, a bank robber robs the bank to get the money. An evil person tries to destroy good and they will never stop, okay? That's what you have to realize. Because when they first started gay marriage, we just wanna get married, don't bother us. Oh, okay, now they're teaching our second and third graders that they may be transgender, okay? And the Christians have stood by will not go well at the final judgment. Amen. So now you're thinking, oh, he's always taken the stand. He's always done this, that, or the other thing. Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, there was a guy that went to a Jesuit high school. He used to go to mass every day. And we had, had about eight people that used to go to mass every day. And there was uh, 400 and something kids in the school. Uh, this class, and there was a kid that was a drug user, not one that went to church, very nice guy, his name was Paul Focal, and he'd come to school every Monday, eyes red, and we used to call it a burnout, okay, he was using drugs big time. This person never said anything to Paul that, hey, this might hurt your life. By the time he was 22, he was dead of an overdose. Mm -hmm. That person that didn't say anything was me. And I've never figured out was it because I didn't care enough about him or I didn't have enough courage. But whenever the opportunity to take a stand comes up, the Lord puts Paul's face in front of me. And that was 44 years ago, not as a condemnation, but as a, I don't want any more Pauls. Okay. So nobody that knows me doesn't know where I stand on the issues. Some people don't like me, but to be honest with you, in the final judgment, I don't ever hear the Lord saying, how many people followed you on Facebook? Or how many friends did you have? That's not one of the criteria. So anyway, so how do I keep myself focused constantly? So I got seven principles. Live each day as it may be your last. Think of the last four things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. I read an article on this when I was 15 years old. And if there's one thing you take and you want to embrace, that's it. And somebody after one of my talks said, how often do you think of that? And I said, constantly. Every time somebody goes by me and flips me off, I think, you know what? If I say something back and I die of a heart attack, the Lord's going to say, Barry, the last minute on earth, you did something that was not what I wanted you to do. Will they send me to hell or not? I don't know. But I don't want them to have that and say, as opposed to, you know, the last thing you did was said, God bless that person. Okay? When you think like that, it's a lot easier to see what's right and to do it. If you're 20 and you're thinking, I'm going to live till I'm 70, it's a lot easier to make bad decisions. I'll have plenty of time. I've had people tell me, we're going to go back to church when we have kids. What, what if you die or you never have kids? So in other words, they're believers, but they think that God just doesn't care. See Jesus Christ in everyone, including yourself. You're no better or worse in God's sight than anybody else. So don't put yourself down 
and don't put yourself up too much. Your job is to live God's laws and get people and yourself closer to God. Don't sit there and think, I'm better than so-and-so. I'm Because you could do that and always find people you think are doing more and doing less. Okay? Mother Teresa gives you a reason not to do anything. Because I'll never be like Mother Teresa. Then there's horrible people that you can go, hey, well, I went to the March for Life once. They didn't even do that, so I'm better than him. That's not how you want to think. That is not how you will find the peace of Christ. Third one, see everyone as the only witness at your final judgment. I like to develop word pictures for myself. So I believe in my final judgment, every person that I've ever interacted with, there will be an image of that person there. Okay? The people here today. And hopefully the Lord will say, okay, did he testify to the truth? Did he get close, you closer? The mailman, was he ever, I asked the kids when I speak to him, do you know if your mailman has a family? I know my mailman, he's retired now, but he had two children. Because I asked him about it once. And you know, he always said hello to me. But those are the people that we just think are there for us. We're not rude to them, but we don't see them as Jesus Christ being in them. And it makes such a difference to people's lives. How many people say hello to the garbage man or thanks for taking my garbage? Those are the little, God bless you for that. Those are the little people. And people see how you act and they want to know what makes you do that? And that opens you up to saying, I'm a Catholic or a Christian for those who aren't Catholic. And that gets people to want to be part of that. Every day, oh, fourth one. We're all born next to what I call the selfish tree. And the way I look at it, it's a big oak tree. And since I'm from Maryland, it's the Shenandoah Valley. Okay? You're born like this, right next to that huge oak tree. When you do something like this, you step back from the trunk and you start seeing the beauty of the world, okay? The further you step back, the more beauty you see. Some people spend their entire lives hugging the trees. They don't get involved in anything and those are the people who get to the end of their lives and wonder what was all that about. They never do anything. And I have one of my favorite quotes, and it's from Teddy Roosevelt, and I think everybody here should take great solace for this. It's called The Man in the Arena. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And being involved in this, father's been involved for 47 years. I've been involved for 47 years. Jack has been involved for 47 years. And it can, I, 10 years ago, I don't think I would have bet that we ever would have overthrown Roe v. Wade. Amen. But the point is we fight. Yeah. And until you die, you're going to do different things for the pro-life movement, but there's no such thing as retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Someone asked Mother Teresa when she was going to retire, and she said, I think an hour after I die, I'm going to look into that. <laughs> Okay? And retirement's not in the Bible. Yes. Okay? Retirement is not in the Bible. We fight to the end. And when the people say, it's, it's my body. No, it's not. It's God's body. In fact, I don't put up, and I said, in fact, there's two bodies. In fact, 
You're the steward of God's body for a short period of time compared to eternity. As soon as somebody starts engaging me, I say, do you believe in God? Okay? That's got to be the first question because we have to change souls. I think a lot of people know that this is what abortion is. A lot don't, and we have to challenge them to get them to realize the death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Okay? And some people are going to react poorly, but you'd be surprised how many people have continued to engage based on that question. There's two girls uh, were there on Tuesday when we were in uh, Connecticut Avenue, Chevy Chase, one of the richest places in Maryland. Found out they went to Holton Arms and Sidwell Friends, probably $40,000 a year. She actually said, can I take a picture? Came up and her friend took a picture with her holding her birth control. These were high school students. When I grew up, we knew there were some girls that, and guys that were having sex. Nobody ever bragged about it like that. Certainly not to an older gentleman who you had no idea. That's the society we are living in now. So I asked her, I said, uh, you know, at the final judgment, that's not going to do you well. And she says, well, I don't believe in God. I said, you do believe in God. You just don't want to live by his laws. So I figured she would walk away. So I started asking her, so how do you think this got here? I mean, if the earth was a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all bake. If it was a little further away, we'd freeze to death. So you think it's all just chance. And so she says to me, would well, you believe in evolution? I said, God can use any mechanism he wants. And I, she's, then the one says, well, so you don't believe in the Big Bang Theory? I said, who created what was there to bang? And, she, and you know what she says? The one who asked me about the Big Bang, she says, well, I, don't, I wasn't there. So I don't know. <laughs> I said, that's a cop out. And so anyway, we talked for about five minutes. And finally, as she was walking, oh, she said, I'm going to be going to University of Chicago. I said, well, my brother is the head of orthopediatrics at the University of Chicago. So if you break a leg, you'll probably see him. And I said, <laughs> yeah. So I said to her, I said, be very careful. And you know what she says? She says, are you saying that because of the racial mix up or makeup of the area? I said, I'm saying that because about 60 people a weekend get shot there. Okay? But she, so again, you feel like she would walk away. And I said to her, someday you're going to regret the life you're living now, and I'm going to pray that comes sooner or later. And they walked away, didn't swear or anything. But here are two kids who were wealthy, but they had no God. They had God, they weren't living by God, but they were dying yes. to talk, to be engaged. Everyone should be comfortable debating. Now, I've been debating since I was in high school. I've said some stupid things, turned people off. That's how you get better at it, okay? As, as Moses said, who was a stutterer, what will I say? The Lord will give you what to say. Don't ever be scared to engage because you think somebody else might be smarter, better looking, whatever. You're a child of God. And another thing, when somebody starts cutting you down or making fun of you, you look them straight in the eye. Because if you remember, the, uh, the kings and stuff used to make the peasants look down when they went by. That's an act of submission. You look them right in the eye, and when they finish insulting you, say, okay, can we talk about the issue now? Because it's very hard for people to insult you when you're looking them right in the eye. It took me a while to figure that out, okay? But just remain calm and you win them over. Again, as I talked about the, the orchestra, I taught uh, RCIC, which is for families uh, at St. John Neumann, and one of our instructors, they have one handicapped child who will probably never marry, and another kid another son was married and his wife was pregnant okay they lived down in North Carolina and they had a lot of um, uh, what do you call it not violence but back and forth with their neighbor okay it got so bad the neighbor killed the wife 
and their son. She was pregnant with their only grandchild. Okay? She left. We only met every month, so Faith and her husband took off one month, and she said, I'd like to address the class. And these are kids from second grade all the way to high school and their parents. And so she came back and she said, you all know what happened. And I just want you to know the only thing that has kept, go kept us going is our Catholic faith. Now see, I've had life pretty good. I have two wonderful children, three grandchildren. I've got a job. So to think that, yeah, Barry's very, you know, big on God and all that, that's, it's not a hard thing for me, but it's when something happens to people like she experienced that me and a lot of people who are looking want to know, is this real? Is this Catholic faith? And I can tell you, she made a tremendous impression on those kids, how important it is. And I tell that story because each of us has tragedies or downs happen. And people are looking at us saying, okay, how, is, how are you going to handle it? And we handle, when we handle it well, people want to know what makes you tick, and they want you to give that to them. Okay? And everybody's, we, my wife and I couldn't have children, so we adopted, which has just been a tremendous blessing. When you first find that out, that's a pretty big deal. Once you get married, you find out you're going to, I wanted to have six, seven kids, and we found out we were going to have trouble, and that's a big deal, okay? Doing things like this, going to the March for Life, those are opportunities where you're going to, God's going to put people in your lives, and you're going to realize that miracles happen. They, uh, I, was, I grew up outside Chicago, and they would have a handicapped day out once a month, and they moved around the diocese. So at our parish, they announced that they were going to have it right near us, and they needed people to volunteer to come up and move wheelchairs and stuff. So my dad, you know, we had four sons. He didn't ask us, hey, would you like to do this? He said, okay, we're going up to help out. So I'm a freshman in high school. I had never been around a blind person. So of course, I walk in the door, and the first thing they say is, would you help John, who's blind, go to the restroom? What do you say to a blind guy? As a 14-year-old in high school, I had no clue. Well, I take his arm, and he starts saying, oh, it sounds like you're in high school. He introduced himself. I introduced myself. He says, sounds like you're in high school. I said, yes, sir, I'm a freshman. And he says, do you play any sports? And I said, yeah, I run track. Oh, what do you run? And I realized he knew I felt uncomfortable. And rather than being bitter that he's blind, he was making me feel relaxed, you know? And I gotta admit, had my dad not told us, hey, and he didn't take a vote. When my dad decided <laughs> we're doing something, we did it. And I used to kid people, i say, yeah, it's a real democracy. My dad and mom vote and then, and, uh, on what we decide, you know? But every time I complain, in fact, when I have the kids, I have them pair off, and we have one person blindfolds themselves, and we walk around the church, and then we switch. And I tell the kids, you know why I did that? And most of them have no idea. I said, when you feel like you've been dealt a bad hand, you remember what it was like to be blind. And you'll think, man, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, I've got this little sore knee or, a, you know, I need contact lenses, you know. And I've got it pretty good. And that makes a tremendous impression on young kids. In fact, I said, okay, everybody close your eyes. Pretend like you're blind. Okay, now you're, you've got cancerous, you know, retinas. The only way you can be cured is if I do the surgery. The price of the surgery is you have to spend an hour a week with me and... 10 minutes a day talking to me. How many will take that deal? And of course, everybody raises their hand. And I said, okay, how many minutes do you spend a day praying? And this is at a Catholic school or a Catholic RCIA. 
Some of the homeschoolers spent 45 minutes. You know, they had Bible studies and stuff. Most of the kids spent less than five minutes a day, if they prayed at all. Some didn't even pray before meals. So I said to him, so in other words, I'm going to give you back your sight, and you're willing to spend an hour with me, 10 minutes a day, and God's given you your sight, your ability to walk, your ability to chew, whatever it is, and you don't spend five minutes. And, of course, if you ask him, do you love Jesus, everybody says, oh, yeah, of course I. Who doesn't love Jesus if you're a Christian, right? But you can't love somebody you don't know, and you can't know somebody you don't spend time with. Okay? And I asked the kids, I said, okay, if you had your first girl or boyfriend, you're, what, what are you going to do communicating? You're going to go, well, if I text them one 10-word text a week, they won't dump me. No, man, you're, I remember my first girlfriend. We didn't have cell phones, but we talked every night. You know, we weren't at the same schools, but, you know, you're texting, you're doing, yet God, who we all supposedly love, we don't even talk to till we need something. Okay? That's what you have to think. In fact, somebody once said to me, I was talking about moral issue, and he said, well, God wouldn't send me to hell for that. As soon as you believe that, you're on your way. You are on your way. Because that's like saying, you wouldn't say, well, my girlfriend won't dump me for that. You don't love that girl or guy. If that's your minimum standard, they won't dump me for that. And we're treating God like that? They actually said that to me. He wouldn't send me to hell for that. And I pointed out, well, actually, it says in Paul, fornicators, adulterers will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so pointing that, those things out and getting people to see it. The parable of the talents. So I tell myself every morning, the good Lord gives me five talents. And every night he comes for his investment. And everyone knows the story, the parable of the talents, right? Five, three, and one. And the master goes away. We all know that's God. So I asked the kids, how old are the servants? And it's really funny. They start guessing. And then somebody says, but he doesn't give an age. And I said, you know why that is? Because then old guys like Jack and me, we know we still got to work the fields. Young people like you know, you better be working the fields. And the middle-aged people better be working the fields. There's no age. Okay? And what happens to the guy that buries his money. He gets damned, right? Bind him and throw him out in the darkness. Will there be grinding and gnashing of teeth? That's hell. Okay? What did he do? Did he kill anybody? Did he commit adultery? No. He did nothing. And at the end of time, at our final judgment, the Lord's going to want to know what we did to stop evil. Okay, it's not going to be good enough to say, yeah, I cursed the darkness without getting involved. Okay, and that's what we have to communicate to people, to our friends, our families, etc. I know about 10 Bible verses that I usually use. I, don't, I can't quote where it is, and you know nobody's ever said to me, where is that in the Bible? Because you can just Google it. Okay, so you don't, have, don't think, oh my gosh, I can't remember, it's James three, one, or whatever. Just remember the quote, and I've given you a few of them, okay? And don't be scared to use those. If people claim to be Christian, you have to challenge them. We're talking about eternity here. Um, let me say uh, one more story. I was in the RCI, uh, RCIA program for adults. That's where we bring Catholics in, right? It was at a different parish, and the reason I switched parishes, that's for a story for another day. But I had helped bring this gentleman in, and we had switched parishes. I hadn't seen him for 10 years. So I go golfing in the afternoon on a Sunday, and I'm coming off the tee at one of the holes, and this guy comes up and says, Barry, do you remember me? And I was like, weren't you in the RCIA program at St. Francis? And he says, yeah, 10 years ago, you helped bring me into the Catholic Church. I was like, great. So we walked back, and um, he's with his wife. And so I turned back, and I said, 
do you still go to St. Francis? Remember, I haven't seen them in 10 years. He turns to her, looks back at me, says, when we go. Okay? So I start pulling away, and it's like I see Paul Focal's face. So I stopped, and I said, let me ask you one question. If you knew you were going to die tonight, would you have gone to Mass today? And to their credit, they looked at each other and said, yes. And I said, this was not a chance meeting. God bless and have a good day. But all it took was one person to say, if you were going to die tonight. And these were good people. But nobody, and again, he, he could have gotten mad at me. It's like they both knew what I said through the Holy Spirit was the right thing. But it was just like it was easy just not to go, not to get up. But you have to, I mean, I could have said that. And he might have said, screw you. It's none of your business. He could have said that. And you know what? I still would say it to the next 10 people. I don't really care how, I, I want them to react and give me the reaction that guy got. But I don't care. Just like Jesus was crucified for testifying the truth. And I'm not Jesus, but that's what he told us to do. A couple other things. Uh, let me tell you the story of my adoption of my two children. Um, my twin sister, who now has nine children, uh, had one at the time and worked in a pregnancy center up in uh, Rhode Island. And the person who ran the pregnancy center knew my mom had an abstinence education program. She st started it back in 1985. And I was in the Navy, and we were trying to delay pregnancy using natural family planning for four years. And I had been out for a year, and we literally found out the day um, uh, that my mother called that we were going to have trouble having kids. So we had not told anybody that we were going to have trouble. So my mother calls and says, this is a really weird call. And if you're not interested, pretend like I didn't call. And I'm sitting right next to my wife. And I said, you're calling about a baby, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And remember, she didn't know that we were having trouble. And it turns out this um, adoption fell through. And so the leader or the head of the birth right center said of the pregnancy center, I know that Kathleen Sullivan, because my sister had moved to Bethesda, her husband was a lawyer. So she said she knew my mother and she knew that Carrie had a brother that wanted to adopt. Well, that was my older brother, and he had adopted a child, and the birth mother wanted it to go to a family who had no children. So a month later, my daughter was born on my wife's birthday. Talk about a beautiful story, right? Yeah. So I've never forgotten my wife's birthday because she's always, she's always doing something for my daughter. So it's always, you know, a month in advance, I know my wife's birthday's coming up, you know? So, so anyway, uh, about five years later, and we actually had gone through the courses to adopt overseas because there's very few babies in this country. And that, this was 30 years ago. So my mom calls me again. And she goes, this is another call. And I was like, oh, what's the story? And she says, OK, there's a couple. The father is a Chicago public school teacher. He's writing an abstinence book for me. And his wife, they already had an adopted child. And they were going to adopt the baby that is now my son. And the adoption, she did not want to adopt the baby since she was going to have one. So the birth mother said, do you recommend, can you recommend somebody? And so she recommended us, okay, or the he. About a week later, and Nathan's birth mother was at University of San Francisco, a priest friend who knew my parents <laughs> found out that Kathy Follin, that's her name, was pregnant. She was a sophomore, junior in college, and was looking for adoption and called her and said, hey, there's a great family out there, the Sullivans in Glenview. The two people didn't know each other. 
but it was because my mother had met this priest by going to talks like this. They were very good friends with Joe Scheidler. I, I heard Joe back when I was like 15 years old. Okay, they would drag us to talk. They would drive an hour to go to a talk. I, I'm talking about from when I was 10, you know? And one person once asked my mom, how do you get your kids to come to this? We'd be the only kids at these talks. And he says, how do you get your kids to come with us? And my mom lied the only time I ever heard a lie. She says, oh, they really enjoy it. <laughs> and, and I was like, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, now I do remember, and as I got older, I really did enjoy. But anyway, so we met Kathy, and we ended up adopting Nathan, and it's an open adoption, and she was raped. So when people say, yeah, rape, my son, who was very successful, got married last year to a wonderful homeschooling gal, and... I say that to people, and the beautiful part is Kathy told her story to a church before the West Coast March for Life, and they liked it so much, they asked her to speak at the West Coast March for Life, and my son got up and talked and spoke for about five minutes afterwards. The whole thing is only 20 minutes, and you will be in tears. I was part of the story and I watch it and I am still in tears when I listen to it. And I will have everyone, if you just Google Kathy Folan West Coast March for Life and we'll send it out, you can hear the story. But it's, it, it will just, and it was just beautiful. As my son said, when you say it's okay for rape and incest, I'm the one you're talking about. And see, what I ask people when I get into it with them, I say, okay, if you were the result of a rape or incest, would you be okay with your mother killing you? And there's been more people, people who are on Facebook. There was a gentleman who, I sometimes get these feeds from a pro-abortion website. So just for fun, I go on there and start making pro-life comments on Facebook. And you can imagine the first ones come back, you know, bleep you. and just a, So I asked this guy. And I figured out he was a 28-year-old white guy going to his Facebook page. And over three days, he went from bleep you to you win, buddy, with a smiley face. And I tell you that because nobody had ever said to him, what if you were conceived by in rape with a single mother who was poor? Wouldn't you have wanted a chance at life? But see, as Christians, and I don't even know if this guy was a Christian, we're supposed to put ourselves in the worst possible condition. And we have to do that for other people to get them to see why abortion is so wrong. Okay? And again, I've, I, and I, I could tell you story after story. But, you know, when you get involved, also the Lord educates you. And... I tended many years ago to be very bitter against the people who were pro-abortion. I mean, if like a car ran one of them over, I, don't, I think I probably would have thanked God, to be honest with you, which was not correct. But the Lord corrected me one time when I got talking to somebody and uh, she, uh, I started talking to her about abortion. She was on the other side. And she says, I've been on both sides of the abortion question. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yeah, I was married to a drunk, and he beat me, and I had four kids, and there was no way I was bringing another kid into the world. I was like, oh, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. What's the other side? And she says, my son got a girl pregnant, and I decided, you know, she had the baby, and I'm raising him. And I said, well, I bet your son's glad you are. And she goes... He never sees that baby. He couldn't care less. And I said, I bet your grandson is. And you could see her going from bitterness to, wow, I never quite thought about it like that. But what God told me was, I grew up in a great family. Most of the people I know grew up in great families. He put her in in my life, I think, 
to build my compassion for the people who have not grown up in the kind of circumstances. And that day I stopped wishing evil or thinking, you know, maybe it'd be better if the Lord took them away. I realized how broken they are and the, the love. And again, she, she talked to me for a few minutes and I don't know if she became pro-life, but I think I made her think. Another one of the great um, joys of my life, I was at 40 Days for Life about four years ago, and I got my rosary and a, prayed to end a rosary, and it was about 200 yards uh, from where I was all the way to the next street. And this guy and these two girls walk up, and they're about at the wall, and the guy turns and spits at me. Now, in 45 years, nobody's ever spat at me. You know, and I've been flipped off and this, that, and the other thing, but nobody's ever spat at me. And my first thought was drop the sign, drop the rosary, and punch his lights out. <laughs> but, I, but I thought that would not be showing him the love of Christ, so I, I just didn't respond. So they walk all the way down there. It was five to three, then it's three, and my replacement was supposed to be there at three. Well, they had been stealing our signs, so we couldn't leave the signs there. So it's 3.15, and all of a sudden, I see these three people coming back. I'm like, Lord, come on. I, I, I didn't do anything the first time, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there thinking, maybe I should just pick up the signs and leave. But I thought, you know, something told me not to do that. So they all came back, and he stopped right where he had spat on me. And he turned to me, and he said, I don't agree with your position, but I apologize for spitting at you. So I went over, and I shook his hand, and I said, that took a lot of courage to come back here and apologize. And then I asked him, I said, aren't you glad your mother didn't abort you? And he said something that I've never heard in 47 years. He said, I believe in reincarnation. How do you know one of my mothers didn't? And that's when, now, that was, no, sometimes you think the Holy Spirit took over and then all of a sudden I'm saying, I hope none of your mothers aborted you. I don't know where that came from, because again, I've, I've never, I've never, nobody's ever said that to me, you know? And so I, so I started talking to him. He came from different abusive foster homes. And so I told him, I said, I'm sorry what you went through, but killing babies will never remove the hurt that you feel. And then he said something that was probably the most edifying, inspirational, Barry, think about this moment. He said, you know why I came back and apologized? I said, no. When I spat at you, you didn't react in anger. And then you think about the passion when the Lord's getting spat upon and he never reacted. I always thought it'd make a great story if he like, you know, like killed the people. But I've heard that a hundred times. You know, it wouldn't have been as good in the message. That's why God wrote the, the gospels, not me. But I've, I've heard that probably 200 times in my life, but it came alive. And, you know, because it's so hard not to react in anger. But this guy who... Like I said, nobody's ever spat at me, you know? So to spit at someone, you must really have a lot of contempt for them. But even he saw the goodness of not reacting in anger. Now, it was funny, I gave this talk last, was it two years ago, and I said I'd never gotten in a violent thing, and the next day we had the, the blow up, you know? So I don't necessarily live to everything I've just created. I try to, but like you, I fall short and I have to constantly beat it into my head. Okay, this is, remember, you might die tonight. Don't lose your temper, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but again, by getting out there, I had a tremendous appreciation for the family I had and all that. And if you don't volunteer for things like this, you don't get your kids you should be dragging cousins. My cousins are going to come out from Cincinnati next year, okay? I've always told kids, I've twisted arms to get them to go to the March for Life to get involved, okay? A lot of people don't react. They don't give me positive feedback. 
but the ones that do come are changed people. And there's nothing greater than that than somebody who comes up to you. I gave a talk to our high school CCD class 30 years ago down in Dunkirk, Maryland, a one hour talk on abortion. And about five years later, we had actually moved. The mother of a gal came up to me and said, I just want you to know so-and-so got pregnant she never considered abortion, and your talk was one of the main reasons why. Now, that doesn't make me a saint, but somebody had gone out on a limb to give her an inspirational talk. And you can be that person. Your kids can be that person. And when they do that, it's just such a, everything changes, you know? Try to go to Mass for you Catholics as much as you can. My life is better when I go to daily Mass. I don't feel as tired, even though I can sleep in more when I don't go to daily Mass. Okay? Tell your high school kids, you know what? If you got up on Saturday and went to daily Mass, you will start seeing miracles in your life. You know? So, anyway, thank you for letting me share that. I really agree to it.